Uh, let's speak now, if we can, to the uh, ambassador or the Ukrainian ambassador to the United Kingdom, Vadim Prishtaiko. Ambassador, great to have you on the programme this morning. Um, I, I just wonder if we can we can start with the, the, the military efforts that are continuing to be made. There is an awful lot of disinformation that is flying around at this moment in the crisis and, and largely coming from the Russian side. Can we put a number on the number of Russian soldiers that have been killed as a result of their uh, war with Ukraine? I've seen the numbers, which our official numbers is more than 14,000 people already. The United States is estimating around 9, 10. Russians are actually reducing, obviously, to a couple of, of thousands of these people dead. How have you been able to achieve that? I mean, certainly, Vladimir Putin thought it would be a simple matter of mobilising on the border, heading into Ukraine, where they would be welcomed as liberators, as heroes. Clearly, that hasn't happened. I believe he's miscalculated a couple of things. First of all, that we are not just starting to fight. We've been fighting with him and with his proxy for eight years. So our forces are sort of battle-hardened. At the same time, what we also have, that we are just defending our own land. That's what he mistake that he still believes that we are the same people. We have our land and we have our direction to go. That's different from what he has for us. It does feel, however, though, that the Russian, Russian tactics have, have changed significantly in the past few days. The advances that they've made have come to a halt. They appear to be regrouping, particularly in areas like around the capital and so on. But the artillery bombardment and the firepower from the air continues to smash cities, well, including but not limited to Mariupol. You're right. They're using ships from the Black Sea. They're using the uh, air, air and helicopters from occupied Crimea to get us. And most of the rockets are just sent to beautiful cities like Kyiv, like, like Odessa. They are threatening Odessa, threatening big cities like Kharkiv and Kyiv. So how then do we, do we bring an end to the violence? We understand, of course, that there have been negotiations taking place. There was a call from your president to have face-to-face -face talks. That doesn't appear to no. have happened between the leaders, obviously. But, but do you see a solution, a negotiated solution to what is happening in Ukraine? And if so, what will you have to concede? We believe there are two ways. One of the negotiations, which are also different channels, and all of them are working. The Turks, the Israeli helping us. But we also have our own negotiations on the border between Ukraine and Belarus. And this is very technical and very painful negotiations they've been doing for four weeks already. But what we can do at the same time, we can actually you know, defend ourselves with everything we have and everything we are receiving from nations like you. And this is helping. That's why we are so effective. That's why we can burn so many tanks, because we have enough, enough firepower to stop these tanks. It's not enough to repel them from our territory yet, but we are working there. Just on, just on the question of, of enough firepower, uh, the, the reports that have been uh, circulating the past 24 hours suggesting that actually such has been the tempo of the Ukrainian military activity that you are beginning to, to start to see a need for more assistance from the West again when it comes to armaments. I mean, is that the case? Are, are you running out of, of weaponry? No, not that much. We, we don't have enough. It didn't have enough in the first place. So running out of weaponry, that's that's we'll be seeing in the, in the week to come. Because tomorrow, President Zelensky will talk to NATO, the whole NATO. We will see how can we replenish our stocks and what we can have much longer range and stronger than everything we have. We have enough weapons to stop tanks immediately when they're approaching to us. But to clear out our land, we have to have something with a much greater distance. Yeah, I mean, just in, just in terms of the, the, the humanitarian cost of all of this, the longer those bombardments go on, the, long, the, the, the greater the number of civilians, innocent civilians, will be dead as a, as a result of all of this. Just give us an idea of what, what the situation is like in, in Mariupol itself at the moment. We've all seen the pictures. There doesn't appear to be very much of the city left, frankly. Used to be four hundred thousand cities, very resort like like Brighton on the, on the beach of very shallow, very warm Sivazov, where mostly kids would go for the resorts with their parents. Now it's more more or less nothing. What we're trying to achieve, we're trying to withdraw as many civilians as we can. Unfortunately, the situation is not good. The people are lacking basic foods, sometimes even water. But these people are very resilient. They are trying to 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 stay where they are. We have troops within the city for fighting really furiously. And this is veterans of the eight years war. They know how to fight and they're putting up a real fight. If you see in the picture how Russian tanks are burning, just coming to a yeah. city, that's what, what is happening there. Yeah, you, I mean, you don't have to, to be a military expert to have been impressed by the fortitude that has been displayed by the Ukrainian people in the face of a Russian invasion and war. At the same time, the strategy of attrition, which Vladimir Putin uh, has instituted, the mass, the wholesale destruction of urban areas, massive civilian casualties. You can be the strongest Ukrainian in the world, 
But after a while, that is going to have a debilitating effect on, on Ukrainian morale, surely. I understand what he's trying to achieve here. That's his tactic, you know, to soften our negotiation position by just killing our own people and besieging the cities. That this is this barbaric sort of approach. That's something he was so proud of being from St. Petersburg and Leningrad, that the city was besieged for more than two, year, two years during World War II. And that's coming with this proud uh, Leningrad dweller. He's doing the same to Ukrainian cities. This is something very difficult to, you know, to, to even calculate, to understand. Just to give us an idea then of, of what it is that Ukraine would, would like to see from the West. Obviously, the NATO meeting is pending, uh, but particularly as regards the United Kingdom, it does feel that the munitions, the skill set that we previously exported to Ukraine, all of that has proved very, very useful indeed. You, you, I don't see anything, any limits here in cooperation with you. That, that's, you know, I'm very proud to be right here in this capital. We have everything. We have weapons, we have support, political support, we have financial support when, at the time when needed. We have been food been sent, even the food, the simple bags and the boxes will be sent to Ukrainians. Everything we, we can come with, with and refugees, every 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 aspect of our war right now and our defense that's been supported and held by, by the UK. I do want to get your view because there's been an awful lot of speculation in this country by Britons rather than Ukrainians about the way in which Boris Johnson's words at the Conservative conference at the weekend would have been interpreted by ordinary U Ukrainians. I wonder if we'll just, we'll just play it first, just to remind our viewers exactly what he said, but it was a, an allusion to, an, to a comparison. Let's play it. It's the instinct of the people of this country, like the people of Ukraine, to choose freedom every time. When the British people voted for Brexit in such large, large numbers, I don't believe it was because they were remotely hostile to, to foreigners. It's because they wanted to be free, to do things differently and for this country to be able to run itself. The, the, the Prime Minister there, and many people domestically thought that that was fairly crass, a comparison between you know, a vote to leave a political and economic union and you and your countrymen picking up arms to repel a Russian invasion. What did you make of what the Prime Minister said? I believe I was sitting at the, at the front, front row when I was listening to it. I, I didn't see that this reaction is coming. Because what we heard in the room, and I, I heard myself, that's actually we are fighting for our freedom, the freedom to do what the nation wants to do. If you wanted to leave the European Union, that's your own decision, sovereign decision. We respect it. We'd like you to be in, in the European Union, but we respect this decision. If we wanted to leave something as a Soviet Union, we had to have a right. And look at the differences. You, you believe you have problems with the European Union when you left? It's not a problem. If you compare it to what we have with Russians when we left the Soviet Union, they came to kill us for this decision. I wonder what you make of, of Vladimir Putin at the moment. Um, a number of people have felt comfortable calling him a war criminal. Uh, we've heard from you know, across the Atlantic accusations that he's been participating in acts of genocide. Actually, the question I wish to ask you is, what do you think Vladimir Putin's mental state is at the moment? I believe that he is delusional now. He was a very reasonable man in his own way. I, I had the privilege on a couple of times to defend Ukrainian position. Sometimes it was with his, with his people and himself personally. So I understand what he thinks. He doesn't see Ukrainians as, as a nation, not, not just what he was told uh, on many, many different occasions, but he just, you can see by conversing with him, he despises you. He don't believe that you're on the same level with him because he's almost tired of, of, of Russia and everything. Who are you to talk even to him? That's the mistake he made. And he made mistake for the whole nation, not for the him only. See, I, I suppose the question that follows that is, given, given your assessment of, of the man, the way in which he operates, is, is there any way that the violence will come to an end in Ukraine whilst he remains in the Kremlin? You know, it's very difficult to believe, and so, so, so little uh, can be said, and so few people believe, but we're actually winning. We can win. With your support, with your assistance, we can actually turn the tide. And for this once in a while, we, we can actually resolve the situation. We don't want to kill Russians or Russia itself. They will survive. What is happening here, this regime might come to end. Define then victory. What, what does victory look like? To, because to my mind, Russian troops standing five metres the other side of the Ukrainian border, that, that doesn't look like victory to me. Not to me either. I would like to be in something which would allow us to have guarantees like, like NATO. That's why Putin is going so against NATO, because he knows if he miscalculated now, he can come regroup and come later. We have to do something which will allow Ukraine to feel itself safe. 
something we hope to have after Budapest when we signed the agreement to give up the nuclear weapons. It didn't work. So I don't want to sign any other piece of paper. It won't work either. There will be any number of people watching uh, this this morning, Ambassador, who have perhaps donated food parcels, who have perhaps donated some of their money, who are perhaps even preparing themselves to open their doors to, to, to your fellow countrymen and women who may well be arriving here very shortly. I wonder if you've got a message um, for the British people this morning. I have a message for them, and I, I know that I will be able to bring this message also in London this Saturday, when I will see the crowds of people with the Mayor of London. We just want to thank, thank you. And, you know, people will do it much better than myself. Those people who would come here and feel the warmth and the, and the kindness and the response from, from the whole UK, they will feel and they will bring this message. What I can tell you, that we will survive and you will have a new friend on the other sides of the, of the European continent. We don't have many things in our history. We are starting to build our new relations. Adam Prishtako, great to have you in the studio this morning. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You.